You're watching Defense Department spokesman John Kirby and General Kenneth McKenzie giving an update on a drone strike U.S. forces carried out on what they originally believed to be an imminent threat to the evacuation at the Kabul airport in Afghanistan. General McKenzie now says that strike was a mistake that killed as many as 10 civilians and that it's unlikely that the vehicle that was targeted or those who died were associated with ISIS-K or were a direct threat to U.S. forces after all. Senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez and former U.S. Army Ranger Jericho Denman, who served multiple tours in Afghanistan, join us now for more on this. Uh, Louis, I want to start with you. This is quite the admission. The military initially thought the person in this car was working with ISIS-K and posed an imminent threat to U.S. forces. Now they're saying none of that was true, and instead 10 innocent people, including up to seven children, are dead. How did this happen? And this is a total reversal from what the Pentagon has been saying on the record now for the last two weeks. As early as this week, I was talking to officials who said that this was, they were convinced that this was an ISIS-K target. Um, we know that the New York Times did an exhaustive search uh, of relatives and co-workers who pointed that the person who was actually driving this white Toyota Corolla was an employee of a California-based NGO that was working inside of Kabul. Um, and so then we knew that, learned that there were civilian uh, casualties. We saw the video right now that you're seeing on your screen right now that showed that there was very little scorch damage uh, uh, in that courtyard where that car had been when it was struck last Sunday morning on August 29th. Um, and now you're hearing that there was new information Information that came in, including the use of some of that New York Times information that came in, used by CENTCOM investigators. They saw that uh, they, they concluded that the ex secondary explosion that they had attributed to um, explosives that were being loaded into the car may have actually belonged to a propane tank that was located just next to the vehicle when a Hellfire missile struck it. Um, that was the cause of that secondary explosion, which many, many senior officials had said was the convincing factor for them that this was that there were explosives in that car. Uh, you heard Secretary General McKenzie acknowledge that this was a tragic mistake, that his forces did not have the luxury of time, that there were as many as 60 individual reports of potential terrorist activity that Sunday inside Kabul. They had been following this vehicle for almost eight hours. It's not enough to create what they call a pattern of life, uh, which would be days, weeks, maybe sometimes months in some of these long-term uh, over the horizon drone strikes. But in this case, they were concerned that there might be an attack at the airport. They were concerned that there might be a car bomb attack. Um, they followed this individual uh, who intelligence seemed to indicate was stopping at all the right places that would indicate that this was a potential car bomb vehicle. But in the end, it was not. It was uh, something tragic. As you heard from McKenzie, we're talking about 10, ten civilians killed, seven of them children. It's, it's really just such a terrible tragedy and an end uh, to the American uh, presence in Afghanistan coming like this after uh, all these years. And Jericho Demon, I want to go to you on the threat environment and how it interacted with the decision to take this strike. Uh, uh, General McKenzie called this a self-defense strike in accordance with the rules of engagement. And I wonder if you can kind of dig into that as well as something that our colleague Martha Raditz, who's covered the military for, for so long and been to Afghanistan so many times, she quoted an intelligence official uh, who told her years and years ago, uh, when you're deer hunting, everything looks like a deer. Talk about the threat environment and how that affects the rules of engagement to go ahead and decide to take this strike. Right, I think the uh, rules of engagement in this in this particular case were probably set up to meet two things. One was to get as many people through the gate as possible, um, while also safeguarding the Marines uh, and soldiers at those gates. I think that uh, looking at the briefing we just saw and, and the pattern of life that we saw, all, although limited, it is reasonable to think that this could have been an imminent threat against against our troops and the civilians trying to get through those gates. Um, with that, you know, again, everything is, uh, it was, the timeline was driven a little harder. And then you have to look at if they'd gone later, what would some of those collateral, uh, damage effects been ha had they waited and we might be having a whole different conversation. 
Now, Louis, part of the administration's defense of the withdrawal from Afghanistan is that we still have these over-the-horizon capabilities to track and fight terrorist activity in Afghanistan. So what does this say about how reliable those capabilities are? He was asked about that when he talked about the pattern of life. Uh, as I said earlier, there are sometimes days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months of tracking that is involved in following these individuals. There was not that ability to do that in this case. However, as Mackenzie said, when we have that capability in the future, um, what you're talking about is the ability to be able to carry that out from a distance. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that that's going to happen in every case? Probably not, because there's going to be a lack of aircraft. There's going to be a lack of intelligence on the ground. There's going to be some signals intelligence, but how much can you actually have? It's going to be very, very complicated. Uh, and, and Jericho, we're talking, and, and properly so, and rightly so, about uh, these big and important issues of, of responsibility of the, uh, at the national level and the, the manner in which this happened. I want to talk about the, the human reality here and draw on your experience. You know, as, as serving in combat, there are, there are Americans who made this mistake. There are Americans who, uh, as they tracked that vehicle, uh, uh, judged that it was a threat. This was people on the ground deciding to take that shot. And, and I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about what they might be going through now. Right. I've, I've been in, in Joint Operations Center many times when we've been watching patterns of life and executing these kinetic strikes. And there's no one in there that woke up that day and said, hey, when in doubt, whip it out. They were all absolutely trying their best to safeguard our troops and safeguard the civilian Afghans trying to get through those gates. And I can guarantee that they went through every manner of mitigation to make sure that this didn't happen. And, and sometimes those things, they do happen. So I'm sure they're going through a lot, but myself, if I were talking to them, I'd say they can sleep soundly at night knowing that they executed the, the policies and the rules of engagement that were given to them. And, and sometimes these things happen. So, Jericho, given that the rules of engagement were followed here and the certainty with which Mackenzie says this attack was carried out, how do we prevent this from happening again? Or is just this just the cost that comes with trying to keep America safe? I think the only way to prevent these things is to pile on more assets just so there's more checks and balances. I don't know how many platforms were watching this event, if there were ways to go through it. But again, the only way to really mitigate this stuff and make sure there's no way to make sure it doesn't happen, but is by more eyes and ears, whether that's people on the ground, whether it's more ISR assets or, or whatever. But um, again, the only way to really mitigate this is with more checks and balances. And that comes in the, in the form of more assets. And Louis, there there was a little there was a question in there about uh, accountability. We are talking about the urgent circumstances and the the the, the layers of decision making that went into this in in the face of imminent threats. But will there be? There is a review, and and is there possible that in a situation like this there would be uh, repercussions into uh, in addition to the reparations that General McKenzie talked about? Terry, it's very possible that there could be some accountability, that there could be some disciplinary action against the individuals who are involved in this strike. But I think there is that weighing factor, which Jericho has talked about, which is the fact that they were doing their jobs. Um, there is the scenario that, as General McKenzie said, they were doing their jobs in a moment of very stressful uh, stressful concern that there were potentially uh, an imminent attack against the airport in Kabul that was about to take place. When you view it through that prism, it's possible um, that the, 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 the potential accountability may be reduced or lessened just because of the situation. And, you know, I, I asked somebody if this was going to be characterized as an accident. Um, and the, the language I was told was, no, General McKenzie is going to be talking about how this is a mistake. You heard him say that over and over again. Now, when well, something happens in a mistake, sometimes people look for blame. But again, what we also heard from General McKenzie is that in this scenario, everybody was doing everything they were supposed to be doing. And it's just that they, they were led to what he said was a reasonable conclusion that this may have been a potential ISIS-K terrorist getting ready to undertake 
a car bomb attack at the airport. But at the same time, they just didn't have that pattern of life. They had been tracking that vehicle for eight hours. It seemed to match the intelligence. But in the end, it, it took two weeks for them to figure out down at U.S. Central Command that this was not the same vehicle, that this was not the individual that they thought they were looking for. So what happens next? Sec Secretary Austin has launched this review of CENTCOM's investigations. Potentially, we could see something down the road. Um, but whether it actually results in something uh, tangible in terms of punishments, that remains to be seen. But in listening to the language today, I think that's probably going to be lessened. And, and it was significant also, I thought, that General McKenzie said that he, as the ultimate combatant commander, the head of CENTCOM, takes personal responsibility in this tragic situation. Louis Martinez, the Pentagon Force, Jericho Denman, thanks very much. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.